Beginning in Michigan's thumb, the Cass River meanders through rich agricultural fields and a handful of small towns and villages before meeting up with the Saginaw River. The namesake of the Cass River watershed, the mighty Cass is also part of the Saginaw Bay watershed, Michigan's largest and home to more than 1.4 million people and habitat for many kinds of wildlife and more than 90 species of fish. The major anchor of the Cass River is the city of Frankenmuth, home of the Cass River Dam. Built before the Civil War, the dam was not only a workhorse for logging and grain industries, but supported the upriver profile that we still know today. Once no longer functional as a power source, the dam remained as a local landmark and photo opportunity until recently, when its maintenance and care became more problem than benefit. The potential failure of the dam was an issue when the option to change the dam from liability to asset presented itself. Most of these dams are, are just like this one in Frankenmuth that have been in existence for about 150 years and uh, have been uh, abandoned, so to speak, um, are in failing condition. Um, it's a bit of an epidemic across the, the state, and in particular on the Saginaw River system. A lot of people don't know that on the Saginaw River system alone there's about 350 dams. Um, some of them are larger dams that are uh, producing power and in, in, in providing for flood control, but a lot of the other ones are what we consider low head dams that were often the uh, used for uh, for mills like this one here in Frankenmuth and those are the ones that um, are in kind of disrepair at this point. Frankenmuth was founded in 1845 as a German Lutheran missionary colony with the river serving as a means of transportation providing access to the Chippewa villages throughout the connecting waterways. The dam nearly as old as the community itself was built to serve the milling requirements of the fledgling community. There was only one road at that time going through Frankenmuth and that was an Indian trail. Everything virtually that was brought uh, to Frankenmuth of any considerable size uh, came up by scow or barge on the river. Now the river is very shallow, so you could not use a deep draft uh, vessel. But what they mostly used were scows or barges, flat bottom boats, and that's how they brought their goods and equipment. When the mill was built up here near the dam, all the milling equipment came up on a scow from Saginaw. The Cass River is named for Michigan's first territorial governor, who would be honored with the renaming after he secured much of the Lower Peninsula from the Native Americans. The river would remain mostly untamed until the settlers in Frankenmuth decided to harness its flow to grind grain and cut wood. The first dam spanned the Cass in 1847. Several mills would soon appear on its banks. The Cass River really was not the Cass River until the Treaty of Saginaw in 1819. Before that, it was the River of the Hurons here on Indians. Uh, so after the uh, treaty was signed, Governor Cass uh, negotiated that treaty and all of a sudden he had a river named after him. By 1890 much of the lumber had been cut and agriculture was embraced as the area's leading industry. The dam continued to provide power for the mill which ground flour until the mid-20th century. The higher water levels above the dam provided recreation opportunities around the same time. In the 50s uh, when I was a kid, the Conservation Club sponsored boat races on those holiday weekends and there were up to 2,500 to 4,000 people on a weekend that would go down there and see these little hydroplane boats race along the river. Yeah, it was really cool. By the year 2000, it was evident that the dam was in need of repair. This coincided with studies that concluded that many of the dams needed to be removed. This was nothing new for the Cass River Dam, which had affected the fishing upstream so adversely that residents petitioned the local game warden for its removal in 1915. Nearly a century later, biologists and anglers were about to get their wish. One of the things the Partnership for the Saginaw Bay Watershed works on is the delisting of all the beneficial use impairments of the Saginaw River and the Saginaw Bay. It is an area of concern of the Great Lakes. Fish population and degradation of fish habitat are too big of the items that uh, this project will start to improve. Uh, we're going to open up 73 miles of spawning grounds for fish. Uh, we really want to repopulate naturally the Saginaw Bay with walleye pike. Scientists were soon wading in the Cass River and even shocking fish to get a survey of what lived beneath the ripples here. CMU started sampling in 2011. So we were looking at a couple different things. We were looking for fish eggs, um, we were looking for larval fish, and then any adult fish that we would find later on in the summer. And surprising, we found eggs above and below the dam of 
different species. Um, but definitely we found more below the dam, we found more species below the dam, and just more fish below the dam. The dam was obviously blocking prime spawning beds further east, but it was also serving the purpose as an obstacle to invasive species that had taken hold of the Great Lakes. We do know that in the Cass River, um, the Frankenmuth Dam historically blocked migration to sea lamprey. However, every once in a while in the spring, during high flow, sea lamprey would move upstream. Um, and so there are sea lamprey upstream already when the, when the dam was here, so that wasn't really a factor in this project. The Cass River effectively became a laboratory over the past few years, not only with biologists, but hydrologists too. There's been a lot of science that's ongoing with this project. We have a lot of fluvial geomorphologists working on this project. A fluvial geomorphologist, yeah, they're a pretty fancy word for a hydrologist. Uh, that's somebody that works with water. <laughs> well, I've worked with everything that has to do with water, but in the last 12 years I've worked on river restoration projects, and that includes rock ramps like this one. Dr. Sandy Berry of Ellen River Partners was called in to design a 300-foot wedge of rocks that would be capped with large stone weirs to allow the fish to ascend to the level of the old dam. It's literally a ramp of stone that starts out low below the old dam and ramps right up to the top of where the dam used to be. <clears throat> and that's a platform we put these curved rows of rocks on, on top of that rock ramp. So each row of rock is a step, and there's a 30-foot pool between each step. How much step has been adjusted by trial and error over the years? Two-foot gaps were too much, and designers eventually agreed to seven-tenths of a foot between each boulder. Fish will swim up horizontally, and when they get to a step, they can use their side fins or their pectoral fins, and they'll set their body at a 30 degree angle and they're able to swim up that column of water that goes through the stones there. So that's what it's all really based on as far as the fish getting up there <clears throat> because most fish can't jump. The salmon and trout can jump and they can get over but the warm water fish actually swim up the water column. This isn't the first rock ramp in mid-Michigan. In 2009, nearly 40 miles of the Shiawassee River were opened up for spawning when the Chesney Dam was replaced by a smaller structure. And it looks like right now these rock ramps provide really good habitat for smallmouth bass, so they are providing a recreational fishing opportunity, and there's also going to be increased recreational fishing opportunities upstream of the dam now that this, is, this dam is removed. The success of the Chesney Project is evident with kayakers, families, and photographers all taking advantage of this unique water feature. Frankenmuth was counting on the same draw for their $3.5 million venture, and the time to remove the dam had to be carefully timed out. The reasons we're constructing at this time of year is because historically the river flows are at their lowest. It allows for easier construction, it allows for uh, the contractors to work in the river, in a safe and effective manner, which is very important to us. Once the spring comes and the snow melts, uh, you know, the river is a lot higher, they'll be flowing a lot quicker. You won't see the rock formations to the extent that you see them today. Much of the year you won't see that. Frankenmuth Dam is unusual because it's built on a curve. Most of them are in the straightaway, you know, <laughs> but here it's on the bend. So, <clears throat> so when we do these circular pieces of stone that sit on the ramp, they're not concentric. They have to wrap around this way and then that way, just like a conveyor belt at the airport when your luggage goes around and you see those plates. It's the same thing that's happening here. You gotta adjust all that. Blasted from the world's largest limestone quarries near Alpena, 50 million pounds of stone were hauled into Michigan's Little Bavaria. There's uh, nearly 25,000 uh, tons of stone that we had delivered starting last year, and it's taken several months of just stone deliveries to get it to the site. You know, we have five-foot uh, stones, we have uh, three-foot stones, and then a blend of two to three-foot smaller stones. And uh, so the, the stones that you'll see uh, near the surface, at the water surface, are their larger ones, and they are uh, wedged with what they call a footer stone. So they have a, a larger stone wedged by a smaller stone, and that, that, that is sitting on a bed of stone as the foundation. 
Working in the river required very specific environmentally friendly processes and actions. Uh, we have four pieces of equipment that we've targeted to, to work in the river and uh, the hydraulic oil has been uh, switched out with uh, environmental friendly uh, vegetable based hydraulic oil uh, so that uh, that allows in case there is some sort of incident that allows it to not have an impact to the river and the, and the surrounding conditions. The impact of the fish passage is already evident to those who work here every day. Before we uh, uh, demolished the dam earlier last week, the fish were already up to the bottom of the dam, so they were waiting. You know, they were there. It was working at that point. So, you know, it'll be interesting and very, you know, rewarding to know that uh, all this work is, was worth it. Ramps used by the trucks will stay in place, acting as new kayak and canoe launches. Even the road can be used to portage around the shallow center passage. You can see those rocks on the south side of the river uh, kind of exp expanding, extending along the bank. Uh, eventually there will be two what they call veins uh, reaching out there and, and as opposed to the weirs which cross the river uh, perpendicular, veins uh, are almost parallel to the river but they, they angle out into the river. The construction site included a parking area for sightseers who frequently went to the riverbank to see what all the splashing was about. You saw lots of people bring their lunch at lunch hour or come and spend the afternoon just watching them bring the, the, uh, the rocks in and how they moved it. And, and it was really kind of dance in the water to see the skill of the operators. Removal of the top of the dam brought up some old boards and rebar and a look at what the 1925 cement rebuild of the dam was like. They found uh, some uh, tie pins that may have been as long as eight feet long, but the tops of them with their heads, uh, they found some other things that's over in the kind of the junk pile, but they had to remove it as part of the project, and that's all in. So the museum will be able to go through all that, those things. They found a tire, they don't know how a tire got in there. The community effort that originally built this dam is reflected in today's partnership. Now this really is a, uh, uh, a case study in project partnership and the way federal, state, local, and private governments and private citizens really need to work together. Um, you know, this project is cost shared. The city of Frankenmuth is the non-federal sponsor. They're providing 35% uh, of the overall project costs. But a lot of those funds were raised in the community by private businesses um, and private citizens donated to the project. Um, just the, the collaboration with the Fish and Wildlife Service, with other uh, environmental organizations, including the state of Michigan, um, you know, really uh, brought the project to fruition and really made it what it is today. Today, photographers are bringing their clients here for photos. Tourists rest along the banks to enjoy the relaxing babble of the river. And those who have spent countless hours making this happen have made long commitments to make sure it does what it's supposed to. The purpose of the project is fish passage. We want to make sure that's happening and that the, the fish are actually able to pass. Okay, So we'll be out here uh, again for the next several years until this ecological success is achieved. Um, and it's very, you know, if it's not, if we're not seeing the results we expected to see during the study, um, you know, we'll, we'll potentially modify some things or, or continue that monitoring until we actually see the results uh, come to fruition. This is a win-win for the fish and a win-win for the people above the dam. It's a, it's a great, great compromise to solving the problems of fish passage and keeping the backwaters so those people can enjoy what their beautiful scenery in the backwaters. What we want to make sure is that we don't have all our eggs in one basket. For instance, we don't want all the fish spawning in one tributary, therefore if something bad happened to that tributary, then the fish community would really be affected. So we want to make sure by, by opening up this increased habitat up here, we're increasing resiliency and providing other habitat for the, for the fish in Saginaw Bay. Wildlife is already embracing the new location to find fish in the shallow pools. Some ospreys have taken nests in there, some minks have been seen already uh, nesting in, in the stones. Giant fish are also expected to swim through the channel here. In fact, a sturgeon was caught below the dam just a few years ago. The lake sturgeon are a very long-lived species. They live up to 115, 150 years of age. Females don't reproduce till they reach 20 years of age. Males, approximately 15. So. 
It takes a long time for lake sturgeon populations to rebound, and lake sturgeon are a threatened fish species in the state of Michigan, so we're working closely with the state of Michigan and our project partners to restore lake sturgeon populations in the Great Lakes, and the Saginaw River watershed is one of high interest for the Fish and Wildlife Service and our partners. The Frankenmuth Fish Passage Project at the Cass River Dam has opened up 73 miles of spawning habitat for native fish of the Saginaw Bay providing for natural and sustainable reproduction in a world-class fishery. For the city of Frankenmuth, the project created new tourism markets through ecotourism. For the entire Great Lakes Bay region, the presence of healthy fish marks the presence of good water, something very important for this region and for all of the Great Lakes. While long in coming, the Frankenmuth project successfully combined environment and economy right here in Michigan's Little Bavaria. The architect of the project, Sandy Vary, has simpler thoughts about Frankenmuth and the rock ramp. Well, it's a great town, beautiful town, and I know we're adding to it now with what we're doing out here. 